Welcome back to Glamour Unfiltered, hosted by me, Josh Smith. And today we're joined by the two stars of Amazon Prime Video's latest exclusive show, Little Fires Everywhere, Reese Witherspoon, Kerry Washington. Hello. Yes. Hi, Dad. That was quite the intro. Babe, you know, we've got two queens in the house and you deserve <laughs> the hype. Thanks. And speaking of hype, Little Fires Everywhere is coming to Amazon Prime Video on the 22nd of May. I'm buzzing for it, as you can tell by the energy levels in here. But one of the <laughs> things which I'm obsessed with about it is it raises so many important discussions that we need to be having in our society today, especially around the concept of what constitutes a woman, right? What does that idea mean to you sat here in 2020? Well, I, I think about the lack of storytelling about motherhood in general, mm. you know, just hundreds of years of lost storytelling, because we didn't really see it on film very much when, you know, narratives were being decided by people who had never been mothers. Yeah. So now that we have this opportunity to create, I mean, it's such a rich piece of material, the book, Little Fires, and it talks about motherhood in so many different ways and so many different types of mothering. And I think um, really brought them broadens the spectrum of what we we think of mothers you know not quintessential good mothers or bad mothers but this whole spectrum of behavior because this concept of a good mother comes through the entire narrative of this and there's so many pressures in society even today to play up to this idea of what constitutes a good mother how's that played out in your own life I think it's so important to talk about it I think sometimes we take for granted this idea because they just sort of come down through society and history, these kind of codified ideas about like, this makes you a good mother. And different cultures have different ideas, but we just believe it. Like we just buy into the story and think like, oh, I have to follow this checklist to be considered good or bad or otherwise. I love that we are, that we created this project where we actually get to step back and think about it and talk about it. It has made me, it has made me think more about having a little bit more compassion for myself even as a mom especially in this time where there's so many different pressures right now we're being asked to like run companies run households be teachers or teachers assistants like you know we're there's so much it's we can't do it all perfectly we we actually literally cannot do it all perfectly mm -hmm. so to kind of re-examine that, that message that we're even supposed to is really freeing and exciting. Yeah, and that whole concept of the working mother is such a complex thing because with that comes pressure because you're constantly like, am I giving enough to my career? Am I giving enough to my family? Like, has that been difficult for you guys? I'll start to get really excited, Josh, when you start to ask dads in your interviews. Yeah. But or work, you know, work-life balances or what it's like to be a working dad. Like we don't even use the terminology working mm -hmm. dad. It, and I think that undervalues the role that men play in the home to just yeah. assume men are supposed to work and that they also don't have pressures, it's different, but that they also don't have pressures. So I'll be excited in your next interview to watch when you're interviewing some dad about what his work-life balance is. My job is to really just kind of do the things that I feel called to do and meant to do and to set that example for my kids. Like guilting myself or not chasing my dreams or um, making myself feel bad or, you know, all of those things are would be detrimental to my role as a mom. Like part of being a mom is also being gentle and kind and loving to myself so that my kids see that that's the example of what we're supposed to be and strive for. Oh my God, for sure. And bringing up that point of the fact we don't ask men in the public eye what it's like to be a working dad, because we yeah. don't, that doesn't happen. <laughs> and this is obviously set in like 1997. And we've come so far in terms of equality, even since then. So we think of that quite as like a recent time period. But going back to this time, 1997, and also being a person in 2020, how far do you think we've come in that time? And actually returning to that time, did you actually be like, well, actually we haven't come as far as I thought we had? A little bit, like we talked about the kind of mad men paradigm, like what happens when you look at our world through a lens of seeing it 
then and comparing it to now. So if you just look through a 90s lens, there were some things that were much more progressive and but then there were other aspects that we talked about race and class um, in a way um, that wasn't as thoughtful or even acknowledging um, the kind of disparity between people's lives or the way that they were treated. Um, so that was kind of fascinating. We had to spend a lot of time actually going, no, 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 people didn't say that then. Mm. Um, and, and there were expressions that people used like colorblind, I'm colorblind, um, which we now know is very insensitive to, to not deny somebody part of who they are. But just playing with all of that was actually really uh, incredible to have those tools. And Carrie and I grew up in the 90s, so we were actually teenagers yeah. <laughs> in the 90s. So we were able to help with that um, aspect of the writing as well. Mm. When you think back to the you in 1997, if you could sit them on that Zoom call and they were here, right here, that's me. What would you want to say to them? What kind of advice would you want to give them? Oh my God, like when you ask me that, all I want to do is hug her. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to like, it's going to be okay. It really is going to be okay. I think I would tell her to stay with herself. You know, I think like kind of on the journey through life, I've noticed times when I've abandoned myself to be a pleaser or to try to fit, live up to somebody else's idea of who I'm supposed to be. So just, I would, I would really invite her to try to stay with herself as much as possible. What would you say to the 1997 you, Reese? Ah, uh, don't worry so much. Don't <laughs> worry. Just yeah. worried. And I think that I, I spent a lot of time worrying about things that really didn't matter. Mm. You know, and, and I was, it's not entirely my fault. Culture kind of told young women they had to worry about things that you know, what we value about women is then is very different than what yeah. we value about women now. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, hold on, sister. It's about mm -hmm. to get a lot better. Yeah. What kind of things would you worry about then? Body image, um, you know, uh, not being enough, not or being too much for people. Yeah. <laughs> My ambition was too big. My ideas were too strong. I was a little too loud, too friendly, too upbeat, too emotional. Yeah, I endured yeah. a lot of really yucky conversations and bad situations to get where I am. And also I had a million of wonderful adventures that brought me to this place. So I'm, I'm an accumulation of all those ups and downs. And I'm, I feel really, really strong at 44. You know, 44, I've been through a lot and I've got a lot more to go not to, to be not so worried about taking up space right like with my body with my attitude with my influence like don't don't worry about being big it's okay to be big and loud and bold and even to make really big mistakes take big risks learn big stuff rather you know have big tears like just do it just go for it mm. this one precious life is all you got yes <laughs> Because it is interesting because this idea of always saying you're too something seems yeah. to always in media, in press, in society does tend to get attached to women more than it does to men. 160%. Even now, that's still happening. It's true. It's true. For me especially, I think this project has been so much fun and so special because there really is so much power in partnership with women and to be working with a woman like Reese, who is not afraid to take up space and who's not afraid for the other women around her to take up just as much space and to have a voice as loud as hers and, and instincts and input that's welcome. Like it's just really so wonderful to be in an environment where there's not a limited slice of the pie. Like there's room for all of us and all of our bigness. And that's how we cook up these exciting, creative adventures together. You guys have set up your own companies. You are rewriting the rules, which is what your characters <laughs> try to do in Shaker Heights as well. What do you think is a turning point for you guys in setting your own rules? And what is kind of the rule that you will continue to live by from here on in, do you think? It's such a good question. 
think, you know, a lot of things are shifting and changing in our business. You know, we're seeing a lot of um, different ways that people are consuming media, the the big, powerful industry titans that were so important when, when Carrie and I first started. Um, it's not the same. Everything is shifting and that there's room for different voices and different perspectives. And I would just say that it's an incredible time to be an artist, a writer, um, an actor, a director. I would encourage more people who have felt like they were other or didn't have an opportunity to um, really dive in. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be one of the busiest times in our business. And I think the doors are more open than they ever have been. I feel like now, particularly in this pandemic moment, like we're really all realizing how little power and control we have um, because there's so much unknown. Things are changing every day, but if, but if we can just stay present with each other, like open-hearted, honest, I feel like we have a shot to make it through each day, maybe moving a little closer to who we want to be as people, as a culture, as a society, as a world, you know? And one of the things mm -hmm. I loved about this narrative is it really shows how society, other people, how it stalls others people, and how important it is that we are all allies to one another. How important is that message to both of you? And how's that played out in your own lives, that sense of allyship? I think about that a lot. I, it's so important to me that young women feel supported and mentored in every business but particularly our, our business where media is so pervasive and it can be very influential in young people's lives. I wanna create spaces where people can tell their stories and feel seen and valued. So it's really important to me and partnership, female partnership as Carrie said so beautifully is so important to me because for so many years we were told to sort of think about it as a competitive space, that there was scarcity and I, I just don't think that's, I just don't think that's a winning principle either. I think abundance is what I kind of meditate on, that creativity is abundant and relationships and the ability to create is everlasting, but it's infinite when we partner with each other, particularly mm -hmm. people who have been told not to partner with each other. <laughs> right. That's right. I think there's something so special about this show now living in, on a global stage, particularly in terms of how we explore the idea of race. Um, Afua Hirsch has a beautiful book, Rit-ish, that I love that's all about kind of belonging and racial identity in the UK. And, um, and so it, I think similar to in the US in the 90s, there's this sense that like it's better to not talk about it. It's more polite if we just avoid the topic and only talk about the special ways that we come together and overcome but not kind of dig into the, the deeper themes of identity and belonging. So I'm really excited that the, those kinds of conversations are gonna be able to be had globally because it's not an, a, an issue solely in the United States. I think that's really well said too. And I also would add on to that, I would say, it's a great show to watch with your teenage kids because yeah. it does talk about race, sexuality, class. And mm -hmm. if you're not talking with your children about those things, they're talking to somebody else and getting ideas from somebody else. So it's a great conversation starter. Sometimes it's easier to watch a show than have to yeah, about life. My mom used to do that. My mom, every week, used to watch 90210 with me. <laughs> because, and I was like, oh, I'm the coolest mom ever. But she shared, looking back, that it just, it, it meant we could talk about drinking and drugs and sex. And it wasn't about me and my friends, it was about, those characters on mm. TV, which was such a smart parenting approach on her part. And there was one last thing I wanted to ask you. This is obviously all about little fires creating big blazing fires. But is there a little fire that happened in your lives that has actually become a very big empowering fire? Oh, sure. I've had a million of those. <laughs> Instead of complaining about a problem, like I, I, I tell a story about how I read a terrible script and it made me start a company because it was 
so poorly written and it was just terrible that I thought women deserve so much better, better roles, better opportunities in our business. So that definitely was like, that script lit a fire inside of me. Who knows why it was that script at that moment that I was like, if I don't start doing, producing myself, this is just going to get worse and worse for the girls that come after me. Hmm. And what about you, Carrie? I feel like the Time's Up movement has been that as well, right? Like there were these tiny little fires, not tiny, for in each of our individual lives, they were these cataclysmic fires, but that we made tiny and not sharing them with each other and the world, or that the world made tiny by ignoring us or quieting us. And as we came together as women all over the world and across industries, we've been able to say time's up together and, and, and be part of a movement. This is all about building bridges within communities, little fires everywhere. So let's hope we keep doing that, building those bridges, even though we're more disconnected than ever which is the sad reality of the situation, but it's still possible, right? No, but we're still, I mean, it's what's interesting is we have to choose connection now. We can't take our connections for granted. Now we have to really choose to spend time and not necessarily space, but emotional space. So mm. we're connected, it's just different. I think that's so well said, Carrie. That was beautifully Steve? said. <laughs> Real smart. <laughs> Half the time we do these interviews, I just look at her and I think, oh, where did she come up? That's so smart. It's beautiful seeing you guys on screen together, even though you hate each other on screen for most of it. But it is pure fire. You guys are so flames. <laughs> Keep spreading those flames. Well, thank you, Josh. And we're so excited for everybody over there to see it. We can't wait to see the response. This response in America was so fun to watch, so we can't wait to see the tweets and all the comments. Yeah, and obviously it's difficult when you play a character that people hate, right? I've never, I, it's so fun for me. People have never <laughs> hate watched me before. It's so great. <laughs> it's you love to hate love They to love to hate us on this show, don't they? Really, it's intense. It's intense. Well, good luck with the Twitter hate. <laughs> Thank you. We'll need it. Thank you. And stay safe. It's been great speaking to you. Thank, Thank you, Josh. Good to see you, honey. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.